So uh, the same as most mornings, we'll just get rolling. Uh, I'm here early. I don't mean to come this early, so, but I usually come 10 minutes before, which would be now. And uh, we usually have some videos to run that have some relevance, obviously. Uh, this is two forms of water, frozen and liquid, um, topic of our course. So we're not so interested in uh, the behavior of frozen materials, but ice creeps and flows very, very slowly, as you know that glaciers flow downhill, glaciers flow downhill. And they are also quite brittle as well, as you're about to witness, I guess, in, in this thing. Uh, and of course, it's a big uh, uh, scientific issue now, exactly what happens if you most of these uh, glaciers go out over water and float on the water, a so-called ice shelf. And if the water is warm and melts them, then it removes that ice shelf and allows that buttressing effect, stopping the ice coming from uphill uh, and allowing it to come down much faster. So that's a, a scientific question of, of interest right now. And um, I guess this is playing longer than I thought. It culminates in something, so that's about to happen, but I guess that happens at two minutes or something, I suppose. Or at one minute 43. A lot of whooping and hollering, I guess. No idea where it is. But anyway, so uh, the topic of our interest is fluids. Uh, I guess water in uh, three forms represented there liquid water, solid water, and presumably vapor uh, in the air as well that you just can't uh, see so easily. I'm, I keep the sound off because it, I guess I could play it because I don't record it. So yeah, so I'm just going to walk through these to see ready. This is kind of interesting as well. I think this is close captioned. Rocks and a slick, dirt slick started appearing. And I thought maybe that's pumice because they're large floating rocks. Then we started progressing into much thicker pumice. First we thought it was whale poop, and uh, uh, but then it uh, became obvious. So this is interesting. I, I've used this for a couple of years, and it was certainly before the Tonga eruption of this past uh, January. It happens to be close to Tonga. I don't. I have no idea whether it's the same volcano. Obviously, a much gentler eruption. And of course, I don't know whether people you can buy it in the stores. People used to use pumice, which is of course a rock which is ejected volcanically. The pores are closed, so it has lots of air in it, so it will actually float on water, uh, like a cork would, because it's less dense than water. And people used to use it as an abrasive in the shower to be able to uh, remove dry skin. I, I guess you get little scrapers these days, which are like uh, little files. Um, but this is just an eruption that occurred that put up a whole bunch of, of pumice field, probably rocks, probably smaller than the size of your fist, that uh, will spread out over the, the width as far as it will go. It wouldn't want to stack up more than one pumice rock high, I don't think. Uh, and just sit on the so anyway they're just transiting across that so again buoyancy we'll talk about buoyancy in this class um, this is quite a tragic uh, event it's six months since the unthinkable happened it took just seconds for the dam to collapse so this is a tailings dam at a mine in Brazil uh, a few years ago, maybe, uh, run by v Valet. Tailings is the uh, rejected material. Once you mine, a, probably from the color of the soil, it's probably an iron mine. Once you take the ore out, you process it, you end up with all the extra gang minerals, uh, which are usually water-laden. They're impounded as water-laden slurry behind a dam, which itself is made of that slurry. And this happens to be in real time, a collapse that wasn't desired or wanted that ultimately uh, wiped out a, a village down below. It killed three, 300 people uh, or so. So another thing related to this class, of course, is that uh, one reason you need to understand these things, as we'll talk about later, is that uh, 
as engineers, which many of you aspire to and many of you will become, um, public safety is part of your remit. And so you have to design things so they don't collapse. Uh, accidents always happen, but it's your responsibility. They're off. Your responsibility to, to guard against that, obviously. Uh, and I've never quite worked out whether this is a spoof or not. Obviously, this is uh, fluid mechanics, two people hurtling through air. Uh, terminal velocity is defined by gravity pulling you down and um, uh, drag acting against you to push you up. So you reach some equilibrium between those two forces. It's just F equals MA uh, when they're balanced, drag pushing you up and gravity pushing you down then they, uh, you reach a terminal velocity. And you can work out what that is based on what we'll talk about in this class. So I'm curious about this as to whether it uh, is real because the one guy, as you see, goes to the ground without a parachute. And uh, you'll, you'll see. And so I'm curious whether it's real or whether it's a, a deep fake. I think it is real. Uh, so, so we'll let that unfold and I'll be quiet. I guess the one in green. I don't know, does he have a parachute on? I can't tell. And of course you can control your speed, I suppose, right? By increasing the drag on your body, by going horizontally as he is going, rather than diving as you would do into a swimming pool with your hands above your head and pointing downwards. Uh, because you'd lessen the drag. The same reason that cyclists crouch down on their handlebars and wear hats that have this long cone behind them is all to reduce drag. Anyone watching La, the, the Vuelta, the Spanish Tour de France, contradiction in terms, which runs now, it's probably running this morning actually, which is in Spain rather than uh, France, a 21 day cycle race. Any cyclists in here? No? Not talking to me today. <laughs> That's unusual. <laughs> Real or fake? What do you think? I have no idea. It's not, uh, it's not a trick question. Uh, but it's quite a feat, I think. I guess you have to be confident of your abilities and being able to hit a target, which is, probably seems quite small when you're at... I don't, when, I don't, didn't see where he started. Did he start at 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet? 25. 25. 25,000 or 2,500? 25,000. Yeah, so five miles, right? Roughly. 5,000 feet in a mile. Yeah, so anyway, so that's that. Well, um, We might as well get rolling, I guess. Uh, we're a few minutes early. Uh, all things are recorded. So now you have to listen to me instead of look at uh, the, the eye candy you have. Any questions, first of all, from last time? Anything you didn't understand uh, or I didn't mention in, our, uh, in my long 50-minute diatribe? No? OK. All right. I'll turn this. So anyway, so the point is maybe that fluids are all around us. Um, I guess uh, I will use this. I guess I can put it in full screen mode. Yeah, I didn't say this last time, but obviously, well, and it pains me that I have to say this, but it's uh, clear it's a, a, a problem everywhere, a ubiquitous problem so in, North, in the US especially. Uh, and that is if there's an intruder, then it's a run, hide, fight. Self-explanatory. If something happens, get the hell out of here. Two doors at the back. This door goes interior to the building and then up. I guess we're slightly below ground here. The windows are out here. But get out. Uh, if you can't get out for whatever reason, then hide, hunker down, barricade, do whatever you can do. And if there's an incursion, to use a euphemism, then you might as well fight because these things often don't turn out well if you're passive. And so it pains me that I have to to say that, but uh, and it should pain you that you have to hear it. Um, but it's a, a reality, unfortunately. So anyway, so 
self-explanatory. Hi there. Okay, what do I have on our list for today? So, a normal day is starting off, me getting here 10 minutes early, running some videos, and then rolling into what we'll talk about. I use the course notes, which are on the course resources page, um, which if you haven't been to it already, um, I guess I could do, I guess I could open this, and uh, I guess I can do this. Course resources page actually is on my home page from here. And so we mentioned this the last time. You can download these course notes. These are the ones that you just saw on the screen that I'll be scribbling on today. Uh, you'll note that last uh, Monday's class is already online. Uh, and you can run that in any mode you want, should you not have it. And it'll be the, the same for all other classes that we have. If I remember to turn the screen recording on, which I have done today, um, so that will be what's going on uh, otherwise. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Okay, I guess it stopped. Um, in terms of... Uh, what else? Uh, we didn't uh, talk about group presentations. Um, probably too early to talk about that. Uh, uh, there are some examples online. And so you're, you'll be sometime in the semester, maybe week five or so, you'll be divided up into groups of about five. We're a class of 120, so it'll be about, um, what's that, uh, five, uh, 10, 20, uh, 24, not me, 24 groups, uh, and you'll do these presentations, some examples uh, online. This looks too mathy. They're, they're supposed to run about uh, three to five minutes and can be of some fun fact that you can uh, enliven your colleagues with by introducing it. They're all recorded. Uh, the easiest way to record it uh, is to do it, make a PowerPoint presentation and then to record the narrative in PowerPoint and then convert the PowerPoint into a, a movie. Uh, it's easy to do for a group of five. If you use five individual slides, then each person can record their own narrative on the slide. You can combine them in a single deck, and then you can um, convert them, export them as a, an MP4 file or a .mov file, and then upload. People either upload it to Canvas or upload it uh, to YouTube uh, or, and provide a link. And so pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not onerous. It's, it was worth 10% last time. It's worth 15% this year. Uh, can be a fun thing to do. Just some. So uh, around the, the third week or the fifth week, you'll be asked, you'll be put in groups, you'll be asked to meet, you'll be asked to forward a topic, and that will be your topic. Uh, we try and do it so there aren't repeated topics, uh, just out of interest uh, for people. Uh, this is a snap we moved used in class, actually, that people have used. Kelvin, Helmholtz, instability. Two liquids, uh, different viscosities placed above each other. You, it develops a whole bunch, a series of waves, which is kind of cool, uh, and explain exactly why that occurs based on the viscosity and the density contrast in the fluids. Um, so, yeah. so find an interesting topic that you can uh, deal with. So you'll get to do that as you go on. Um, I'll mention again the, the, the homeworks. If you haven't found the homework and exams on Canvas, I, sh I need to ask this. Who hasn't downloaded the homeworks and the exams? <laughs> Is that the right way to ask the, ask the question? Fine. Go. I'll, I'll repeat again. Seventh edition of Munson are the questions. They're online. Don't use the ones in the book if you're using them. Biggest arbiter of how well you do in this class is looking at previous exams because 70% of the grade plus, right? Because it's 70% plus 10%, 77% of your score, uh, 77 points out of 111 uh, are based on uh, the midterms and the final. So I think it's worthwhile using it. So the other things here is how to make a, a PowerPoint into a movie for your presentations. Uh, it's the grading rubric for those, uh, which I guess um, for the presentations. 
the YouTube channel where the movies are that, uh, that you see down here, but this is by far the easiest way to find them. And uh, some examples from, I guess I haven't uploaded them for 219, 20, or 21, but uh, nothing's changed too much. Okay. Um, prerequisites, I signed someone's concurrent Math 251 form yesterday. If you don't have the prerequisites and you get disenrolled, then I will do that for you. You just have to sign off on the form that I we process jointly. You sign it, and it says, I don't have the prerequisites. I've looked at the material. I'm comfortable with it, and I, I'm, I'm okay with it. And so it's basically agreeing uh, on our deal that we have with each other is that I treat you as adults and vice versa, and that if you want to take the class, that's fine. It's your responsibility to to work on it, to be able to, to get through it. No, no need to um, delay graduation based on that. Uh, TA office hours aren't set up yet. You probably don't need them this week. Uh, no one's dropped by my office yet. Uh, my door's been open both days uh, since Monday. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, yes. No. I. I I, just out of, um, for two reasons, uh, it's easier for me to do it, that's not the only reason, but you'll be, they're assigned uh, and based on the idea that, you know, when you get into the work environment, you'll work with the team and you have no control over that, so yeah. And so sometimes minor skirmishes uh, develop uh, within the, the presentations because it's a, a group project. Um, there is a peer review, peer report where you can uh, report on people within your group who are uh, performing less uh, fully than other members. And there is a, a sanction for it, I think. 80% of the grade is based on the score for the presentation, and 20% is based on the peer review of your colleagues. So that's one way to sort that out. Sometimes there are minor skirmishes. I see people in my office saying they can't reach their team members, no one's responded. And so sometimes, if that's the case, it could be I contact the team members, or I say just do it yourself and let them figure it out. Uh, and so they're left adrift and haven't got it. And you, it's really not much effort to be able to do this presentations. It's a five minute talk around some interesting topic. It's quite doable for a single person to do. So, so that's often, uh, there are a variety of scenarios that work out. Hopefully that won't, it won't come to that. Okay. okay. I suppose I should repeat questions just so, every, so, I, so it can be heard here. But I guess that question answer probably uh, defines exactly what the uh, the question was. All right. Okay. So these are the uh, the notes that you have, um, and I will use this. Oh, it does have this. So my favorite color is red for some reason. Um, so these are the things that we'll talk about today. We'll talk about defining what fluid mechanics is. We'll talk about dimensional homogeneity, adding apples to apples. Uh, the equations, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, should be the same units. We'll talk about some fluid properties uh, and define them. We'll talk about equations of state, which for a gas are uh, the ideal gas law and its derivatives, and the compressibility of gases and, and liquids. And we probably won't get to wave speeds. So you'll see some stuff, and I'll end up writing. So we'll talk about these um, individual things. Bless you. Um, we call it fluid mechanics, uh, not liquid mechanics, not gas mechanics. Liquid, fluids are liquids and gases, as you know. Um, and so the easiest way to, to talk about that is maybe to uh, talk about what I'll call, have to get used to writing on this thing again, see how good my writing is. Fluids in life. Actually, I'll do one other thing before I do this. I think in the notes from last time, so this is class two. Uh, the notes from last time, this is, I haven't talked about this. So maybe just uh, talk about this in general, what fluid mechanics is, uh, liquids, gases. Some solids, like ice, behave a little bit like liquids. They flow. Uh, talked about uh, tsunami last time. Tsunami happened from um, earthquakes are the biggest ones, but we talked about one from this uh, eruption in Tonga last time. The most notable one in recent history was the bo so-called Boxing Day earthquake in Indonesia, which spawned the tsunami that killed maybe 200,000, 250,000 people in Indonesia. 
the basic mechanism is you get an offset uh, in the seabed. Uh, when you all of a sudden you move this up by tens of meters, the water goes up with it. Water can't stand as a wall, and so it just flows away as a big uh, ripple. And uh, the consequences are clear. Typically, we talked last time, it moves very quickly across ocean basins, maybe half the speed of sound, 300 miles an hour, half the speed of a jet aircraft. Um, they're very small in the middle of the ocean. It's only when they come on shore that they ramp up on the land. Too much drag underneath, that's moving quickly, and so it kind of falls over itself, and then it piles up as really not a breaking wave, but just as an inexorable rising of the water level, like a high tide coming in very quickly over you know, periods of minutes, 15 minutes rather than over six hours, right, which would be a tide rising. Atmosphere is a big fluid system in terms of hurricanes. The Earth uh, mantle beneath the crust. The crust beneath our feet is probably 50 to 70 kilometers deep. And then beyond that, it's molten rock, which feeds volcanoes. This is moving by convection, and it's the mechanism by which the slabs move on the surface of the Earth. Glaciers in Greenland creep, they flow, even though we don't think of them as fluids, they are fluids at some level. Uh, pollution from the deep water horizon, for some of you, well, for all of you are engineers, and some of you are petroleum engineers, you don't want to be the person who screws up on the well and ends up with BP paying $20 billion to restore the Gulf. Uh, that probably doesn't look very good on your resume, uh, and so this is the sampling for the pollution that uh, came from the deep water horizon. Uh, May the 18th, 1980, twice before your birth date, right, 40 years ago, um, Mount St. Helens, uh, blue fluid inside was magma, dropped off the side of the mountain. And so those are all in kind of natural processes. In engineered systems, such as you perhaps are interested in, internal combustion engine, about to be a dinosaur, slowly, I guess, but clearly that's fluid mechanics with chemical reactions, expanding fluids, exerting pressures, deep water horizon, um, uh, with not sealing the well annulus well enough with the grouting and gas coming up and blowing up the rig and then opening the hole on the seabed. The way uh, that you fly across the country is by using an airfoil. The way that the plane that you fly in gets its airspeed is by using a pitot tube which uses Bernoulli principle to stagnate the air at this tip and then measure the pressure of that stagnated air and compare it with a port here that is measuring the true air pressure that's outside and is used with GPS to measure um, uh, speed of the plane. A famous accident on Air France flying from Rio to Paris where this got clogged with ice. It iced in a storm, so they couldn't get the airspeed. It fed into the, the servo control of the plane. Plane crashed uh, and never arrived in Paris. A tragedy maybe a decade ago, certainly within your lifetime. Uh, for those of you who are energy engineers, uh, single, single axial uh, wind turbine, um, a wave machine using the articulation on the sea to be able to generate electricity in the articulated joints. Tacoma Narrows Bridge, resonance set up on a bridge. You've probably seen it in your science classes. A slow, steady velocity of air blowing across the, uh, the bridge that uh, shed vortices on the downstream side, alternately from the top of the deck and then the bottom of the deck. And this shedding, rhythmic shedding, produces uh, an excitation, which if it's the same characteristic frequency of the bridge, it pulls the bridge apart, which it did, I think, 1957. Uh, getting gas out of the ground for gas shales along pipes, which we'll talk about. Getting uh, geothermal energy out of the ground. Getting contaminants that have been spilled out of the ground. All problems which uh, you'll work on. Oh, recreation. Sailboats, obviously. It's not just uh, that the wind blows and you go in front of the wind. But the wind really, or the sails are really working as an airfoil. Um, the America's Cup, when New Zealand first took, Australia first took the uh, America's Cup from the Americans, I don't know, uh, 25 years ago, a radical keel design that used to get put in the water shrouded so they couldn't see what the design was, but it had a fin on it which made the boat uh, go faster. They banned these. Maybe this was the. Um, Sydney Olympics. 
they had all body uh, swimsuits in the years. It, it wasn't uh, Michael Phelps yet. It was Torp, Ian Thorpe, the, the torpedo. Uh, they had full body suits. Uh, they decided they were too efficient. They allow little bubbles of air to exist on the suit. They have partial ones, right? So they wear these suits which have no arm coverings and no leg coverings, I think, right? And they, or perhaps they don't have chest on them, I can't remember. But they get have bubbles of air, get set up by cavitation, uh, and they act as a lubricant, if you like, to make you go faster through the water. You spin a baseball to make it curve. You dim, sorry, you spin a baseball to make it curve. You dimple a golf ball for it to go further. Seems kind of oxymoronic that by making it rougher on the surface than smooth, it would go further. But what happens is that the, the roughness makes it go into a turbulent regime much earlier at a lower speed. And therefore, when it's turbulent, the zone around it is much thinner that provides drag. And so it, counterintuitively, it's much more efficient, has a lower drag when it's turbulent flow around here rather than laminar flow. We haven't talked about what those are yet. And of course, you spin a football to make it go straight, uh, just like you do with rifling in a gun. Uh, surfing West Virginia is, uh, you can stay on a wave on the front. It's gravity pushing you down on the front of the wave. The wave coming up underneath you, which is dragging on the bottom of the boat. And so if you balance the drag against the boat, which is stopping you going downhill, and gravity is pulling you downhill, you can st sit statically on a wave and have the river flow underneath you. Same deal on a, a snowboard. Um, Drag is controlling your speed of air against your body. Um, there's friction, but not very much on the board, which is also pulling you back, just like drag on the bottom of this uh, board. And gravity is pulling you down. So a lot of things that we do is a competition between gravity and other fluid forces, which we can use to, for instance, define velocities. What, how we stay static on a wave. We can tell the velocity of this guy falling through the air. Uh, from that uh, balance. And it's all related to F equals MA. All right, so let's get down to some real stuff. So fluids in life. We've made the case that this is fluid mechanics. Uh, and so I, let's see, I've got to get used to this. I guess I will do this. So I do this purposely so that if you want to write, then you can. If you want to not write and view the videos, then that's fine too takes a bit more time because I'm trying to draw drawing three boxes so we have three materials that we could think about first is uh, a solid the second is a liquid and the third is a gas and so obviously for fluids these are kind of the ones that we're interested in a liquid and a gas. And we'll talk first about properties. And so I'm doing it specifically. Sorry. So I mentioned before we'll work in SI units, System International, right? And so for us, the units are uh, mass, which is a kilogram, length, which is a meter, and time, which is a second. Um, we don't use uh, temperature, but in the book, the symbol they use for temperature is theta, which is Kelvin or degrees centigrade. We'll talk about those today. De degrees Kelvin or degrees centigrade. Um, so in terms of the properties that we need to know, density is in units of kilograms per cubic meter. Um, the, the term we use for it is rho, which is density. We'll use that throughout this class. And in terms of these, uh, I just, just use, this has a high density. This has a, a high or low density. And this has gases low density. So a solid, uh, a solid, you know what a solid is. If you put a force on it, it maybe deforms. So if I put, for instance, a shear stress on the top of this, maybe this would uh, deform to look like this. When the force is taken away, if it's elastic, it would bounce back again. Certainly if I squeeze this, it moves an imperceptible amount, uh, and then it springs back as soon as I release that. 
A liquid fills the container which it's in, but not above a free surface. Uh, so that's different. And a gas, of course, fills the container completely uh, and expands to fill that container uh, and is constrained by some kind of pressure that uh, constrains it. We talk about viscosity. The units for that are newtons per meter squared seconds, also known as a newton per meter squared is a pascal second. And again, the unit, the, 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 um, the symbol we'll use for that is mu for dynamic viscosity. We'll talk about dynamic viscosity. Viscosity. Um, and uh, we won't, uh, we'll talk about it on Friday. We use Newton's um, law of viscosity, which is the shear stress applied to a body is equal to the velocity you're shearing it at over a characteristic length. And this term here is the dynamic viscosity. Mu. And so for viscosity, well, you know what viscosity is. Treacle is a viscous material. Uh, gas is not a very viscous material. And so if we took these, this is highly viscous. This is uh, medium viscous. I guess I should have, could have used, it's both. And this is low viscosity. So God bless you. We will talk about uh, compressibility. which is how compressible something is. Um, the units of compressibility are 1 over stress, 1 over pascals, which is the same as 1 over newtons per meter squared. And the unit, or the term that we'll t use for that is beta. The, we can also talk about bulk modulus. Uh, the units for that, it's, well, it's actually 1 over beta, 1 over compressibility. So bulk modulus is the reciprocal of compressibility. So if something has a high compressibility, it's got a low bulk modulus. And the units of this are in pascals. And the unit that we'll use to represent it is modulus. And so in terms of compressibility, Incompressible means low compressibility, so I guess a solid would be low, a gas would be high, and a liquid actually is kind of low. Uh, so, uh, did I get that right? Um, yeah, low compressibility, high compressibility. And so, by definition, the bulk modulus of these will be the opposite. So this would be high, this would be high, and this would be low. So those are the terms that we will use, and maybe we'll define some of those today. Don't worry about this expression. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess we'll define compressibility as well. I won't do it now. So that's our initial terms. We'll use those uh, equations throughout. I'll use V as lowercase v, but uppercase volume, I'll use a line through it, and I'll mention that when we get through it. The other thing is uh, that there's often a row looks kind of like the term that we use for pressure, P. And but they're not, obviously. They're different things and they're different units. So don't be confused with that. So rho that we use for density is, um, is not pressure. Okay. We'll talk, let's talk about dimensionality. I'll get used to writing uh, soon enough. And so what is, um, so always when we have equations, we want to be able to add apples to apples. So that both sides of an equation 
should be the same. So for instance, an easy, perhaps the easiest way to demonstrate that is just to talk about something like um, a quantity such as area. And if you wanted to know the area of something, so if you want to know the area of this block here, my drawing will get better as I go on. This is x1, x2, y1, y2. You know that the area is just equal to the integral, double integral, I guess, dx, dy. If you integrate it between x1 and x2, and y1 and y2, then you end up with something that looks like uh, x. If you substitute the limits, you know how to do this. It's ele elementary. x2 minus, well, it's x, y plus c. And if you substitute limits, it's just x2 minus x1 times y2 minus y1. And so merely to make the point that the units of this, obviously, are in meters squared, si, which is the same as length squared. You can't, the area has to be that because you know that, but you can tell from this. x and y, you can tell directly from this that the units of this on the left-hand side should be this because the operators are written in terms of those lengths. Forget about the d's, Right, small changes, and just take the x and y's, and that will give you that. So a has to be in units of length squared. The, the right-hand side has to be in the same. Uh, some equations that you'll use in petroleum especially violate this agreement because you work in strange units. But those units, you have to use very specific units in the equation to get the right answer. In an equation that's dimensionally homogeneous between the left and the right side, you can use feet, you can use inches, you can use meters, you can use whatever you want, and you'll always get the, the right answer in, that, in, in terms of that. And so that's important. So for instance, if your equation on the right side would be in units of dx, dy, dz, you immediately can tell that that equation is wrong because the units on the right-hand side don't match up to what they should be on the left-hand side. And so dimensionality is a useful thing for us to, to know because it allows, it can't tell us whether an equation is right, but it can certainly tell us when an equation is, is wrong. So that's one way of, uh, of looking at dimensions. Another example would be to look at the Bernoulli equation, which we haven't dealt with yet, but you've probably seen in your previous classes. And in this class, we'll use uppercase z, not uppercase, as a, a, the vertical dimension. And so Bernoulli acts with a fluid traveling between streamlines. And it takes a fluid which is present at a location z, has a pressure attached to it, not density, and is moving at some velocity. And so I'm sure you've seen Bernoulli's equation before. And so if we write Bernoulli's equation uh, down in the way that I like to write it, uh, elevation is equal to pressure over density times gravity plus velocity squared over 2g. It's a g, not a y. And that is constant along any streamline. So along the streamline that goes through this midpoint, if it's this streamline here, everywhere along this line, if you take a point here, or if you take a point here, the sum of these components will be the same. Obviously, the elevation z will be different, so one of these other terms must change to, to compensate. We know that this equation, uh, has to be the same units throughout. We know that the units of this equation have to be length because one of the units is this. And so we could use that if we wanted to to figure out what the other units are. Or we can just play around with it to do that. Um, what else do we know? Yeah. 
Okay. The other thing that's apparent in this equation, why don't I use, change colors for a moment, is that if we take this equation and divide it, I didn't mean to do that, this equation is basically, actually, I guess this should be minus, but no, don't worry about it. These terms represent the acceleration. So acceleration is equal to a mass times a rate of change of velocity with time, dv dt. And so, uh, for instance, these aren't, this isn't dimensionally homogeneous because this is a force, and this clearly isn't a force, but that's what these terms represent. If we wanted to know what the units of force were, we could work it out from this expression here, right? We know that the units of force have to be uh, mass. We know that velocity is in terms of length over time. Uh, and we know that dv dt is, is rate of change of time. So we have another time on the bottom. So this term here is meters per second squared, an acceleration which is, we know exactly what that is. And so, by definition, the units of forces have to be units of mass times length times t minus 2. And so, it would be, if we look at the SI units, it would be kilograms, meters per second squared. So a newton is the force required to give a kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second squared, right, by definition. And so that's exactly what a newton is, and that is in terms of newtons. So we can do some interesting things to play around with these. The other things that we can play around with is that we can, since we know that these are all the same dimensions, what we could do is we could take two of these at a time, and if I take these two right-hand ones here and combine them together, which ones am I going to do with which? I'm going to take uh, this and divide it by this term here. So pressure divided by density times gravity. And if I divide by this term here, v squared over 2g, then what I can do is I can get rid of this, I can get rid of this, and I have an expression which now is pressure divided by rho times v squared. There's a 2 in there, don't care about it. This term is called an Euler number. It's the ratio of um, pressure forces, driving flow to the inertial forces, right? This is a Newton's second law, mass times acceleration. This is inertia, the same as me accelerating this across the room. It has some inertia. If, I tried, if this was liquid and I was accelerating across the room, it would have some inertia as well. And so this, is, this by definition, since we've divided this by this, we've divided a length by a length, and so the units of this have to be null. There are no units. And so the units of this would be mass, length, and time, all to the power of zero, right? No, no units whatsoever. And so that's a, a useful number for us to, to, to use. The other number that we'll use, uh, let me use a different color here. I'm going to use this. Oh, actually, I didn't want to. I wanted to use something funky, like green, so, so you can see where we're going. And again, this one here. And combine these. And just to make sure I get the right ones right. So if I use this left hand one here and divide by this, we get v squared over 2g divided by or multiplied by 1 over z. And if we multiply these out, again, we don't compare, worry about the unit here, we get v squared over. CG. We can do anything we like with it. We've said that because we're dividing length by length, uh, it should come out to have no dimensions. And so we can square root it, and we get velocity divided by square root ZG. 
And so uh, this is a balance between potential energy and inertia. And so if you think if you're in a boat, the boat creates a bow wave. And so uh, the inertia, the boat pushing on the, the wave raises it up. So it gains elevation. And it does it because it's working against the inertia of the wave, which doesn't want to move. You're pushing it. It doesn't want to move. And as a result, the resistance against the boat going is the bow wave that it has to basically climb up in constant steady state. And so if you want to have a very efficient boat, you want to have a very small bow wave because that makes your boat much more, more efficient in doing this. And this um, is called a Froude number, Froude number, F-R-O-U-D-E number. And it's for open surface things. So in other words, where you have a liquid that has a free surface in it, and you're interested in gravitational forces due to elevation, like water flowing down a ditch. It flows by gravity, not by pressure. And so a Froude number defines that behavior. The other non-dimensional number that we'll work with is called a Reynolds number. These are all ratios of uh, forces. So this is the ratio between inertial and viscous forces. Forces, I guess, both top and bottom. So um, this term here is the inertial force. There is no viscous force in this. Bernoulli's equation for, is for an inviscid fluid, a fluid that has no viscosity, which is a good approximation for many fluids, surprisingly, even though every fluid has a viscosity. And uh, the magnitudes of this would be a velocity, a length scale, a density, and divided by a viscosity. Velocity, not volume. A length scale, I choose, chose not to use Z, I could have done a density and a viscosity. Again, this is non-dimensional, has no dimensions, and it's useful in classifying exactly how flows uh, evolve. So um, these are kind of horrible notes, but they're useful. They're taken from your, the textbook that you may or may not buy. Um, I, I do lots of things by writing it because I think it's a useful way for you to to accommodate information. One thing related to dimensional homogeneity is that in our ninth week, we'll talk about uh, a thing called Buckingham Pi, uh, kind of an interesting name, uh, Buckingham Pi theorem. Buckingham as in a person's name, Pi as in the number, 3.14, and a theorem as in a way of uh, dividing, uh, defining things. And it basically says that if you're doing some experiments, you can take all the experimental variables of density, viscosity, uh, velocity that you have in your experiments. You can define the dimensions for those quantities, such as if you're working in lengths, it has units of length. Mass has units of mass. Um, density has units of mass per unit volume, kilograms per meters cubed. And there's a formal way to take those units and describe the non-dimensional groupings of parameters, so how you might group density and pressure and area and velocity of flow in a single coefficient or a single or a few numbers of coefficients to do the minimum number of experiments that you can get away with to be able to completely define your system. So it's an incredibly powerful tool, not just in this class, but in your lives as you uh, go on to engineering. And so this is just to, to make the point that we will, I, I prefer to use the MLT system, uh, mass length time, but there is another one called the force length and time system where you work in terms of units that are forces, lengths, and times, uh, but they're essentially the same. And it just means defining things up into the appropriate parameters. If you look in terms of here, you'll see this. This is what we talked about, temperature. The book, should you get the book, it uses theta for temperature. Um, so it's a fourth one. I guess it would be a, a fourth parameter here if you wanted to use it for both of these. Um, and of course, you can determine the quantities of things. For instance, uh, if you wanted to know the quantities of viscosity, 
How would you figure that one out? Well, you don't know yet, but you know that Newton's law of viscosity is this. We said before that the shear stress you have to apply to a fluid, say wind blowing across the top of the ocean, the shear force you have to apply on the top of the fluid to move it uh, gives you a gradient of the velocity as you go down from the surface over length of depth as you go down. So this is velocity, this is length, this is viscosity. You could rewrite this, I suppose, as viscosity is equal to shear stress multiplied by length divided by velocity. Um, we don't really know what shear stress is. A shear stress is equal to a force over an area. A force is equal to mass times acceleration over area. So I guess we could take this and we could put it here. And so if you want to get the units of this, shear stress would be um, mass. Acceleration is length over t squared. So that's mass, acceleration. Area is length squared. And we're left with length over length times divided by time. Right? And so let's see if I've got it right. It's going to be mass. You can get rid of some terms, right, in this. You're probably better at this than I am. Uh, length squared, length, length. Uh, there's viscosity on here. Alphabetically, it should be down the bottom. There you go. See, I'm not a complete fool. <laughs> I can't do something. Right? That's exactly what we have up here. So, so you can always work in units to get units that you don't know from units that you do know. And so this is a stress, which is a, a force per area. If you don't know what the units of force are, you can write it in terms of Newton's second law, F equals ma and then use the, the basic units. Mass is kilo. And so this would be uh, this would be kilograms per meter per second. Strange units, which is also what we referred to as Pascal seconds. Pascal is a one Newton per meter squared. You know, know your units. So, okay, we're getting up to the witching hour. Um, one last thing to maybe do is talk about um, pressures. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked about uh, pressures in terms of stresses. Um, let's talk about pressures and temperatures. I looked at my watch, I see we've got about five minutes to go, so we can clear this up. So we use a particular length scale. So if you look at pressures, we talk about absolute, and we talk about gauge. Can't, can never spell gauge properly. Might be spelled G A G E in the U.S. Anyway. So absolute uh, pressure, absolute pressure is zero. Atmospheric pressure is uh, one bar, bar as in barometer, and one bar is equal to about one o one times 10 to the 3 pascals. So 101, that's 101 kilopascals. Uh, you know this as well, right? The units. Kilo is 10 to the 3. Mega is 10 to the 6. Giga is 10 to the 
9, etc. So atmospheric pressure, what we feel here, with all the air in the atmosphere above us, the reason it's 101, K, 101 kPa is that uh, there's air above us up to the edge of space, and so the atmospheric pressure is zero, and this is minus 101 kPa. So this is the positive scale. I use, if you see me writing plus VE, it means positive. Um, so this is the, the length scale that we have to, the pressure scale we have to work with. Likewise for temperatures, we work in absolute and, uh, yeah, so absolute and I, I don't know what to call the other ones. Uh, and so absolute pressure uh, temperature would be zero. It would be in Kelvin uh, or Celsius after the Swedish. Uh, so zero degrees centigrade or Celsius is equal to 273 and change degrees Kelvin minus 273 degrees centigrade is absolute zero. And the temperature we're sitting at here, not quite to scale on this, we're sitting at, should be about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which 68 Fahrenheit is 20 degrees centigrade, and so this is 293. This is important uh, because when we use uh, equations of state, which I guess we'll probably get to next time, we use the ideal gas law. Both temperature and pressures are absolute. And you won't get the result, right result if you don't use that. And so probably I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm not really a question kind of guy, but does anyone have questions? 